Data types that implement the iterator trait can be iterated, for example, inside a for loop and while loop. The function responsible for getting the next item inside the loop is the function next. It takes an immutable reference to self, the data type that implements the iterator trait, and it returns the option of self colon colon item. The loop continues as long as this option returns sum with a value of self colon colon item. But what is this self colon colon item? Well, it is defined over here. It looks like inside the tray, it is defining another type called item. This is called an associated type. In this video, I'll explain what it is and the purpose of it. An associated type is a placeholder type that is defined inside a trait definition. This placeholder is replaced by the implementation. The purpose of an associated type is to restrict one implementation per type. Contrast this with a generic trait. For a generic trait, you can have multiple implementation for a type. For example, let's start by writing this iterator trait using generic types. Here's the definition of the iterator trait using associated type. Notice that the function next returns the placeholder type. So to create an iterator trait using generic types, this type that we're returning has to be generic. We will start by defining a trait called generic iterator, which will take in any type t. It has a single function called get next, which will return an option of type t. Notice the similarity between the associated type and the generic trait. For associated type, the type placeholder, in this case item, is inside the definition of the trait. Whereas for the generic trait, the type t is not declared inside the trait definition. Let's look at examples of implementations for a generic iterator. I'll explain the problem that you might encounter when you use generic traits and the problem that associated types will solve. Let's start by creating a generic struct called array iter. Inside it, it contains two data, the actual array of type t having the size 5, and the data called i, which will contain the next index in the array to access when the function get next is called. Let's implement the generic iterator trait for our array iter struct. We will need to implement the function get next. The function get next will get the next item from the array. We will do this by calling the function array.get. The index to access is stored inside the index i. If there is some kind of value, then we'll increment the next index to access by plus 1, and then we'll return the value that we got from the function get. Otherwise, if get returns a none, then we'll simply return none. Let's look at example inside the main function. Inside the main function, I'll initialize an array iter of type u32, having the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. We'll also initialize the next index to access to 0. And then we can run a while loop. While there is some kind of value when we call the function get next, simply print it out. Execute the code, and we get the values 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So this is an example of implementing the generic iterator for array iter. However, nothing is stopping us from implementing multiple generic iterator for our array iter of type u32. To see this, let's create another example. Instead of returning a u32, let's return a boolean. We will delete this code and simply return sum of true. Now the intention of the function get next is to get the next item inside some data structure. For the array iter case, we want to return the next item inside the array. However, if you look at this code, it simply returns true. So we have two implementation of the function get next for the data type array iter of type u32. But the only implementation that really makes sense here is this code since it gets the next item from the array. The code that doesn't make sense simply returns true. But Rust is perfectly fine compiling both implementations. It would be nice if you can tell Rust that for a given data type, there should only be one implementation of some trait. This is where associated types become useful. So now let's implement the iterator trait using associated types. We'll start by typing impl iterator for array iter of type u32. We will need to implement the function next. And we also need to define this associated type. Since the type that we're returning here is u32, we will specify this as u32. And inside here, the way we get the next item from the array is this code. We will simply copy this and then paste it here. So far, the code is similar to the implementation for the generic trait. The difference is, is that for associated type, we can only have one implementation for our type, array iter u32. For example, let's try recreating this code using associated type. What we'll have to do is copy this, paste it here, change this item to a boolean. And then inside here, let's simply return sum true. 
save the file and the code will not compile. Associated type is forcing us to pick one implementation for our type array iter. And again, the only code that really makes sense here is this code, since this is the code that is getting the next item from the array. Let's now call this code inside the main function. All we have to do is change this function get next to the function next. Execute the code again, and we get one, two, three, four, and five. So in summary, associated types are placeholder types that is defined inside the trait definition. This placeholder is replaced by the implementation. In the code that we saw, we replaced this placeholder type over here. We replaced it with the concrete type U32. The difference between generic traits and using associated types is that for generic traits, we can have multiple implementation per type. And sometimes only one implementation really makes sense. This is where associated types become useful. It forces us to have only one implementation per type.